Grey Hat SSH shenanigans. Uh, this talk is going to be about all of the cool offensively focused things you can do with SSH. Uh, if you are a red teamer or a pen tester and you don't have SSH in your toolbox already, hopefully you'll see why you should have it in your toolbox and all of the cool fun things you can do with it. Um, and uh, if you're advanced, you've already been using SSH, hopefully there's a, a, a tip or a trick or two that you can pick up here uh, as we go through all of this. Um, so what, how is this talk gonna be, uh, how's this talk gonna go? Uh, we're gonna start off with the basics because you have to start at the beginning. Um, then we're gonna start uh, looking at all of the interesting, thing you can, interesting things you can do with port forwards, uh, how you can use those to get past firewalls, uh, hide your traffic, um, make it look like you're accessing systems from other systems and a bunch of cool things. Uh, next, we'll look at the configurations. So fun with the configs. Um, SSH has a bunch of different ways you can modify its behavior and make it do things that users are probably not intending. Uh, leaks a bunch of information about what users are accessing uh, how they're accessing them, where they're accessing them, uh, et cetera. And then last we will, lastly, we'll look at stealing creds. So um, SSH, as we'll see, has access to credential material, and we would like to get access to that, and we will show a couple different successful strategies in doing so. Uh, but first, who am I? Uh, my name is Evan. Uh, I'm also Syndrome on Twitter. Uh, I am the director of offense at a company called Randori. Uh, I'm uh, kind of, I've been red teaming forever. I'm into CTFs, uh, I do CCDC, um, all that kind of stuff. So check, check me out. Uh, let's get into it. So the basics. Um, what, starting off, what is SSH? So SSH stands for Secure Shell. Uh, it is a replacement for the original plaintext protocols of Telnet and RSH, um, which were both used to get shell access onto Unix systems uh, and administer those remotely. Um, SSH can be used to refer to both the daemon and the client. So you will hear someone say, I SSH'd to that box. That means that they use the SSH client to connect to a server that was running the SSH daemon. Uh, and um, logged into it that way, uh, got a prompt and did whatever. Um, the most common versions of SSH that you're gonna run into are OpenSSH. Um, uh, OpenSSH runs on pretty much everything now, um, and there are a few other ones that we'll go over, um, server and client coming up. Um, like I said, it's used to remotely administer systems. Uh, you can upload and download files, you can run commands on the shell, uh, etc. And then SSH also provides encrypted channels, which are little tunnels that you can make in the SSH session that'll let you do port forwarding that we'll see here in a minute, X11 forwarding, and uh, like get, get your shell. Um, so why is SSH useful for an attacker? Uh, really, SSH should be can be thought of as a Swiss army knife for red teams. Um, this lets me accomplish anything I need to do with a system if I can get SSH access. So I can download files, I can upload files, I can run commands, I can maintain access to a system. I can configure the system such that it does things differently than the user is expecting. Um, I can get credentials out of it, all of the things that I need to be able to do to get systems and get into systems and pivot around inside a network. And it's all encrypted by default for me. Uh, so the common SSH clients and tools that you'll run into, um, like I said, on most Unixes, the common SSH implementation is OpenSSH. Um, on embedded systems, sometimes you'll run into drop bear, um, which is just a, like a very small implementation of SSH. And just the difference here is some of the functionality might not, that we go over here might not work in open SSH or in, um, excuse me, in drop bear or some of the other SSH servers. There's actually just SSH.com has an SSH server and there's a few different ones, but most of the time you're going to run into SSH and, uh, most of the stock is geared towards that. 
uh, on Windows, you can obviously drop into WSL, WSL2, and then you're just at a Linux prompt. So you'll have the SSH client. Um, there's a GUI that's called Putty, which is from way back when. And then there's Plink, which is the CLI implementation that uses the same SSH stuff under the hood that Putty's using. And then additionally, on Windows 10, uh, after 1809, OpenSSH is available in the Windows App Store, so you can get the SSH server and the SSH client. Uh, and then lastly, another tool that's super common that we're going to take a look at a little bit here is um, Paramico, which is a Python library that implements the entire protocol, the entire SSH protocol, both client and server um, in Python. Super useful for being able to write scripts to do um, either like log into systems for you and do stuff, or as we'll see later, um, make a server. Uh, another reason SSH is super useful here, it's really simple to enumerate. So by default, SSH is port 22. Um, that's the port that it has registered. You can move it to different ports, but uh, all of the servers, if they're installed just by like with the app or whatever, it's SSH. Um, here you can just use netcat and just grab the banner uh, really simple banner up front. It tells you that it's SSH 2.0 is the protocol of SSH that it's speaking. The version is, you can see this is an open SSH server, 8.31, and then it's running on a Debian system. So just with Netcat, I can tell what um, version of SSH is installed, what or what version of SSH protocol the SSH daemon speaks, what version of SSH is installed, and the operating system. Uh, there's even more stuff that you can figure out. So with Net, uh, Nmap or a bunch of other, there's a bunch of other tools that can do this, but lots of people know how to use Nmap. Um, when you run the discovery scripts, it will do that banner grab for you. And then we'll also enumerate all of the algorithms that the SSH is using. So uh, SSH is a pretty old protocol. There, you'll run into systems that have older, more insecure algorithms and potentially vulnerable SSH versions. So there are some versions of SSH that are vulnerable to user enumeration and command injection and all sorts of stuff. So um, that it is so easy to enumerate is pretty nice. Um, so continuing on with the basics here, just running a command on the remote system, there's two strategies here, essentially. The first is I'm going to connect to the remote system and request a interactive shell. So um, the first command is just SSH. That's going to launch the command line, Bob at, and then the IP address is 10.10.10.10. So that's saying log in to 10.10.10.10 as the user Bob. Um, I cut out some stuff here. It'll prompt you for a password. And then you can just run commands interactively like you're sitting at a console on that system. So here you can see you can run the command who am I, and you see that you're Bob. Um, the other way you do this is to run a single command at a time. So I say SSH Bob at 10.10.10.10. Who am I? It says Bob. Uh, this is super useful if the system is being actively defended. So say one of the blue team or someone is actually on the system watching for connections and seeing who's logged in. This They'd have to catch that and run that command while the who, it, who am I command is running or whatever command you want to run. This is just an example. But they'd have to actually see that to see that you're logged in. You will. This will still show up in last and in all of the logs and everything, but if someone's just sitting there trying to see if someone's actually logged in and watching for SSH processes to start, this will let you have a little race where you can run your command hopefully before they actually catch you doing whatever the thing is that you want to do. Um, like I said earlier, you can use SSH to copy files. So I can copy a file from my system to the remote system, or I can copy a file from the remote system to my system. There's two ways to actually do this. The first one that I've laid out here is SCP, so secure copy. Um, and in the first, the first example here, I'm going to upload a file from my computer to the remote system. So what that looks like is I do SCP, the file that I want to copy up, and then I'm just like before we saw, I'm going to do the username at that system, and then I'm going to give it the path that I want to copy it to. 
So here I want to say in the user's home directory, in the bin folder, name my file not malware. So I'm going to copy my malware up there and hopefully they won't catch it because I called it not malware. And that is super secret and they will totally never be able to figure that out. <clears throat> uh, next, say I want to download a file from their remote system. So I've been looking around and I see that there is this Etsy secret sauce that I'd like to get. Um, from my local system, just like before, it's source and destination, but I want the source now to be the file on the remote system and then the destination to be the file on my system. So SCP, Bob, at the remote system, the path that the file's at. So here it's Etsy secret sauce. And then finally, the my loot folder. So every good uh, hacker kid should have a loot folder and I'm gonna copy that secret sauce into that folder. Uh, additionally, with SCP, I can um, recursively copy. So say I just want to grab everything in that secret folder. I don't know what it is. I'll look at it later. I'm going to go ahead and use the minus R for recursive flag here to SCP. So SCP minus R Bob at 10.10.10.10, .10 .10 .10, the Etsy secret folder down into my loop folder. The next way you can copy files is with the sftp command. So this is secure FTP. Uh, this is actually a completely different implement or different um, part of the protocol to copy those files. So SCP and sftp, while they accomplish the same thing, are actually doing different stuff under the hood. But functionally, it's the same. And if you're familiar with FTP, hopefully this makes sense. You sftp as Bob to 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10. And then the first command, I want to download a file. So I get that file. I say get from slash secret sauce to my loot folder, secret sauce. Um, and then next example, I want to upload a, upload a file. So sftp bob at 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10. I'm going to put from my artifacts folder, the malware. I'm going to just going to put it into not malware. Uh, once again, super secret. No one will ever catch that. Totally not malware. Don't look at it. It's fine. Uh, and similar to SCP, SFTP has a recursive option for the get command. So get minus R slash temp secret from the remote side. So say that's a folder. And then I'm just going to download it into my temp folder until I can figure out what to do with it. Uh, and you can see uh, what happened there. So uh, kind of the basics there. S SSH lets you uh, log into a remote system get a shell on that system if you want. You can uh, run commands singularly so you don't even have an interactive session, so it's a lot harder to find. You can copy files down, you can copy or you can download files, you can upload files. Um, even that just alone is super useful to an attacker just in and of itself, but let's go ahead and move on forward to uh, fun with port forwards and we'll see kind of the more advanced stuff you can do and how you can use this uh, SSH in your tool belt to get around uh, common firewall setups and that kind of kind of thing. Uh, so first here we're going to do look at local forwarding. So in this scenario, I have access to the 10.10.10.10 system. Hopefully that was enough tens, um, and I happen to know that that is sitting on a boundary. So here in this. Um, this slide I'm showing you that I have this box, which I'm going to call my jump box. So 10.10.10, .10 .10, uh, or you'll also hear this called a bounce node and I'll probably go back and forth, but I happen to know that this is sitting on a, like a security boundary here. And there are other systems back in here that I'd like to get access to. I can use SSH to forward ports from my system through that system. Uh, look at a, look a little bit like this. So I'll have, uh, port 8080 on my local system will jump through that 10.10.10.10 system and then point at one of the systems on the other side. <clears throat> All of that will go over the SSH tunnel. So that traffic is encrypted from uh, my laptop here to this system. And then it comes out of here and will wind up over on looking at this system. Uh, what that looks like on the command line is you use the minus capital L for local forward um, and you want to tell it the port on your system that you want to listen on. 
the host that you want that connection to go to on the far side and the host port on the far side that you would like to go to. So in practice, what this looks like is SSH minus capital L. I want to listen on my host on port 8080 on my laptop. <clears throat> I want that traffic when I go to port 8080 to go out the other side to 192.168.1.10 on port 80. So say there's a web server on that system that I'm trying to get access to. And then I'm logging in as Bob to that, that bounce node, 10.10.10.10. I should have done different IP addresses. Um, and then interestingly here, I'm gonna give it minus N. So that tells it not to request a shell, and then I'm gonna background it. What that does is now I have 8080 listening. I can now go on to my next command. I didn't request a shell on the remote system. So once again, if there's a defender watching that system, trying to see like run a who, or see who's logged into it, all they'll actually see is that there's an SSH D process. It doesn't actually spawn a shell or anything. And then if they're really on the ball, they'll look at netstat and see the network connection. But most of the time they just won't realize that there's somebody logged in and then uh, like I said, that's backgrounded. So on my local system now, I can point curl at local host on port 8080. And so there's a HTTP server there that happens to be serving a file called secret that I need to get. And I, I get it and it looks like I won. Uh, that's super fun and all being able to do a local forward, but I don't want to do that one by one by one through all of these systems on this network. Uh, thankfully, SSH was nice enough to think of the this, the, the kind developers of uh, OpenSSH. And they implemented this thing called dynamic port forwarding. So what this does is this lets me open up on my system a port that will forward over that SSH tunnel, uh, uh, either SOX4 or SOX5 proxy. And then I'm essentially using that SSH server as a proxy server and I can get to any of the systems behind that network as long as whatever I'm using speaks that SSH protocol. So if I point my, if I use this proxy port, then I can get proxy that through this system and just get to any of the systems that are behind here in the, the way this kind of basic network example is laid out. Uh, and um, kind of counterintuitively here, it's actually easier to do this than the just singular local forward. So at least on the SSH side. So um, all I'm doing here is minus capital D for dynamic, and that does a dynamic forward. I'm telling it port 1080, just it's a common SOX port. Um, and then same thing, Bob at 10.10.10.10. I think I got that right this time. Uh, and Super nice and easy. Once I run that command, I've successfully logged in. I now have a proxy server. I've turned that SSH system into a proxy server. So what I can do with that is I can point a web browser at that proxy server. So for instance, here, Firefox. Uh, so in Firefox, you go preferences, network settings, manual, manual proxy conf here, and then or click the manual proxy conf button and then do um, Sox host, and here I've picked Sox 5, and then I just tell it my port 1080. Now, anything my browser tries to go to is going to forward over that Sox proxy and come out in that other network. Um, additionally, you can use, I like to use proxy chains. There's actually a couple different tools to do this, but proxy chains is the one that I know how to use, so it's pretty easy for me, is um, you can use proxy chains here, and you just configure it to tell it where the proxy host is, and then um, you use the command proxy chains here. I'm just going to drop in a bash and what proxy chains does is it hijacks the, um, the libc calls to socket, uh, operations and then forwards them over that, uh, for TCP operations, forwards them over that SOX protocol, speaks the SOX protocol and then forwards the traffic over. So anything in that bash bash session gets forwarded over that proxy. You can do one-off commands, but I like to drop in a bash here a lot because you can do curl and a bunch of other uh, nmap and netcat and all that kind of stuff. If to use the right options, because nmap needs to be on layer two sometimes, but um, depending on how you're trying to scan, but for TCP scans, uh, super useful. Uh, and so you've essentially just used that SSH host to bounce uh, into that network that you probably didn't have access to necessarily, but thankfully just to thank, 
thankfully you had access to that one SSH host and you got in. Um, the next way you can port forward is kind of the opposite of the local forward, which is the remote forward. So say I am sitting on my laptop and I would like a port on that SSH server to open up and forward that port back to my system. <clears throat> so I'll do this with SSH a lot to get from a system out to the network and then be able to do all of that same forwarding and tunneling and stuff just in the opposite way. So say I'm actually on, I'd have to be, I have to be on both systems in this scenario. So I'm on my laptop and then I also have access to this system in the network and I'm say I'm trying to exfil some data or something. I can't get out because they're blocking the internet, but I have access to this. And I have access to my laptop. So what I do is I SSH and I set up a remote forward from here that says, Hey, listen on two, 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 two here and forward that back to me on port 22, which is SSH. Then from this system, I can just use any of those SSH commands provided I have the SSH command line and I can do stuff like copy files to here but it's really forwarding to here. So anyone looking at the network traffic, nothing's actually going out over the firewall or anything. It's just traffic going to here. And then there's a secure connection to here from, from the bounce host to my laptop. So nothing actually, unless you're really on the ball, looks like it's coming from this to my laptop. It's routing through this other system. <clears throat> Uh, so what that looks like here is you use the dash R command for a remote. I'm going to tell it what port to listen on and I'm going to tell it the host port that I want it to, or the host that I want it to listen on and then the host port that I want it to forward to. So I say, listen on two, 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 open that up on any. So 0.0.0.0, .0 is the any address and then forward that traffic back to me on port 22. I log in as Bob to that 10.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10 .10. um, I do minus N again because I don't want to actually get a shell here. Um, importantly, to be able to do this listen on 0 .0 .0 .0 .0, the SSH um, server that I'm logging into, so this guy 10.10.10.10 .10 .10 to have gateway ports enabled or else you won't be able to do this by default. It's, luckily, it's a pretty easy change. You just update Etsy SSHD config. We'll look at config stuff a little bit later, but you can uh, just change this. Generally, it is no by default, but you just change it to yes, and then you restart SSH. Your connection stays alive. Everything everything keeps working, and then you can do this. Um, and then from that system that's inside the network that can't get out, I, I SSH to the 10.10.10.10 .10 .10 .10 .10 on port 22. So this minus P tells it to go a different then the default port, I log in. I can either log in or I can copy files or do whatever I want. Uh, important thing to point out is if I'm on a system that I don't control, oops, if I'm on a system that I don't control and I SSH into my system, I am potentially giving up credentials or a password or something to my system. So be careful with this. Uh, make sure that this system, this user that they're logging into is something that they they're not too worried about and that that user's locked down and that they can get to everything or you're kind of letting them into your system and getting hacked yourself and you do not want to be that person. Uh, so that's cool, but it's a lot to type. Say I want to do this same scenario where I have a tunnel and I want to log into that. I want to log in through my, my jump box or my bounce node. And I want to land over here. So I would have to SSH to here do a port forward to tell it to go over here and then SSH to that port forward and go over here. And that's a lot of work and I'm a lazy hacker. I don't want to do that. Um, thankfully the people that implement SSH are not lazy. So they think of all of these things and have it done ahead of time. Uh, SSH has this cool option called a proxy command. Um, the proxy command is the old way to do this and they've actually since implemented a new version, but proxy command is still super useful and we'll see another use of this in just a second. But what you do is you say minus O is option. You say proxy command. I want my proxy command to be SSHing to that remote system again. And then here percent H and percent P get replaced with the system that you're trying to log into. So it would be remote and the port. Uh, like I said, this is kind of the old way to do it. 
the SSH developers were nice enough to realize that this is also a lot to type. So they made this thing called proxy jump, which you can do minus J uh, and tell it, Bob, this is essentially doing the same thing as this. And then you're just logged in. And like we saw, um, you are now have this set up where you're actually SSHing through this system to here. Anybody monitoring this uh, boundary for access to this system won't actually see that because you're actually going through here and to here. You're not going straight to it. So that is a pretty useful way to get around some kind of common network monitoring and popping through some boundaries. You can actually do some really cool stuff with this where you set up like different jump boxes and have them go through different layers and uh, it starts to get pretty, pretty fun. You can do some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, so like I said, though, that proxy command is super interesting. And shout out to SubT for kind of prompting me to look at this. Here, I'm actually using a proxy command to configure my SSH to use an HTTP proxy to get to wherever I'm trying to go. So I'll say that again. I'm using a proxy command to use an HTTP proxy to get to where I'm trying to go. So anybody looking at this traffic is going to see a connection to an HTTP proxy and not even realize that I'm SSHing through that proxy out to the other side. Uh, this is super useful when you're in a network that's very locked down and is only letting certain things through and you have to use an HTTP proxy to get out. Um, or if you just want to blend in. <clears throat> Uh, another thing that is very useful here is so now I have all of these tunnels and this forwarding and all of this cool stuff that I want to set up. But SSH is a TCP protocol. So if anything happens in this connection, any of the routers or something timeout, something weird happens, that connection will die. Maybe I want this tunnel to be set up really long lived. And how I accomplish this is with a command called, SS, called auto SSH. And what I like to do with this is I will set up auto SSH to log into my laptop and forward port um, 2222 on my laptop back to the host. So I apologize, the arrow is backwards here, but the, it would actually forward from 2222 back to my host on 22 and funnel that traffic. So I connect here and it goes out here. So there's an auto SSH connection out. It sets up that remote port forward to come back. And if that connection dies, auto SSH will restart it for me, monitor that process and restart it for me. That effectively lets me maintain access to this and I don't have to do anything to, once it's set up. And what that looks like is you use the auto SSH command. It's just a tool that you can install. I'm giving it some options here, the server alive interval, uh, server alive max count. So this will wait 30 seconds and it'll max try three times. Uh, and then I'm telling it to remote forward on 2222 to port, port 22 on my local host. And then I log into my laptop, AKA Hackbox. Uh, and then on Hackbox, I can SSH minus P to 2222 and tell it Bob, because that's the user that I have at local host. And that's actually going to go through that tunnel back in through the network. And then I'm just logged into that victim system. Once again, this is super cool because like all someone monitoring this network would see is someone logging into a system remotely. Um, so say you're here, this boundary is monitored. All you see is an SSH out. You don't actually see me tunneling back in. So it looks like someone who already has logged into this, just logged into something on the internet. And that is what happened. But then additionally, I'm logging back into that system here. So I actually have shell access uh, that I might, they might not be wanting me to have. <clears throat> so a bunch of fun stuff you can do with port forwarding, super useful for, um, kind of crossing those security boundaries and getting into networks that you're not necessarily supposed to have access to. Uh, with auto SSH, you can maintain that access. 
Uh, and if you get creative with it, you can jump around and get to a bunch of different network segments and uh, really make it confusing. With all the port forwarding, you can make it look like someone's connecting from a different system as long as you have access to connect all through. So someone that's trying to tra trace that back through network logs or system logs is going to have a rough time because you're essentially using a proxy to get through a bunch of stuff. And you can proxy, proxy, proxy and jump around and uh, good, good, clean fun to be had by all. Um, so configuration. So what we're going to talk about here is a bunch of different ways that you can configure SSH to do things that are kind of unexpected or just interesting configurations that are useful kind of in operations or in the, in the process of doing things. First up, I want to point out that we have these escape sequences. So if I've SSH into a system and I have an interactive shell, SSH actually has this kind of hidden shell that you send a special uh, character sequence. It's like a cheat code almost, and it gives me all of this functionality. So what I did here is from my prompt, I did new line tilde question mark, just in quick succession without anything else going on. And that's showing me the help for this escape sequence prompt. Um, probably the most useful, the ones I use all the time, is the terminate connection. So if something messes up with that SSH session and my term, my shell is hung and I can't get it to work anymore, instead of having to drop into another prompt and find the SSH process and kill it, you can just do this tilde, new line tilde dot, and it kills the, kills the SSH session. Um, also super useful if your friends let you sit at a prompt for their SSH and you want to mess with them. Um, just do that real quick. Uh, the... Other one that is super useful here is the uh, background, or sorry, the, the command line. Um, and um, the, that's the capital C. So why is this useful? You, you already saw you can just do this with the command line, right? You can SSH minus L and open up the port or minus R and open up the port and all that kind of stuff. So this is one of those things that's really useful. Um, but not very often. So the the most use I have out of this is when I have access to SSH on a system, and someone's actually actively trying to defend it and they've changed the password on me or gotten rid of my SSH key that we'll see here in a minute um, or whatever. I don't, I can't log back into that prompt. So I can't, or that SSH session. So I can't log out to port forward, but I want to port forward through that because I still have access and they haven't noticed like that my actual shell exists. They just noticed that the account was compromised. So I can still scan the network and do a bunch of stuff from there. I just need to be able to change some of the port configs and I can't log out and log back in. Um, that is when this is the most useful. So um, just like all of the other commands, minus L, minus R, minus D, <clears throat> lets you set up all of those port forwards. And then it's minus KL to cancel them or, or kill them. Once again, super useful. Uh, kind of keep it in your back pocket. It's not um, really common that I run into this, but when I have needed this, it was invaluable. Uh, so we talked, I talked a little bit about uh, uh, authorized key there. So one of the things you can do with SSH is um, trying to log in and put your username and your password all the time isn't very much fun. It's also kind of insecure. And we'll see a little bit later why that is pretty insecure. So SSH came up with this concept of an authorized key. So this is just public, public key cryptography. Uh, I generate a public private key pair. I put the public key on the remote system that I want to log into in a configuration file and say anyone that has the private key for this public key is allowed to log in. So this is very, very useful when you run into SSH for a couple different things. One is if you can get access to someone's pi private key, you can log in to any of the systems as them that they log into. Um, because of that, you actually generally, you're prompted to put a password in to password protect that uh, private key. So when you try to use it, you have to decrypt the private key before you can use it. Um, most of the time, or still a lot of the time, sadly, uh, people that are generating these keys just hit enter twice, and then you get an SSH or a, um, a private key that is not protected. 
And by sadly, I mean awesomely, because it's great, and you find this all the time. Um, so where that file is stored is generally, there's two places. Um, SSH is either, or the SSH stuff is either in Etsy SSH, which is the global configuration, or here where we're looking at it in the user's configuration, which is the .ssh folder in their home directory. Um, so here specifically, this is in Root's home directory. We've generated a um, key pair. The default for the RSA keys is just ID under RSA, and then you'll have ID under RSA.pub. Uh, if you copy that ID under RSA.pub to the .ssh authorized keys file um, for any user, you can log in to that user account without a password. So this is also super useful in the case where I land on a system and I don't know the user's password, so I can't change their password, um, but I'd like to be able to SSH in as them. I can add this key and then I can SSH into that account as them and have a full uh, PTY shell that lets me do all of the things you would do with a full PTY shell, edit files, run sudo, all that kind of stuff. Um, and essentially this lets you maintain access. I don't need to know the user's password as long as that file exists. So um, this is also super useful for um, like hack the box style challenges where you get a web shell or just if you have a web shell as a user and you want to upgrade to that user level access, you if you have the ability to write to this file, then you just add an SSH key in here and you can log in. Uh, SSH by default will um, check the permissions of that file and not use it if they aren't correct, but sometimes it uh, is configured to not do that, so it's always worth checking. Um, kind of the meta here is it's always worth looking in the SSH folder because there is a bunch of different stuff and we'll see more of that here coming up. So up next is the known hosts file. So this file is a list of all of the systems that a user is logged into. For anybody familiar with SSH, when you SSH out to a system the first time, it'll say, hey, I don't recognize this system. This is the public key. Do you accept this? When you do that, it saves that into this file called the known hosts. Um, the, that known host file will have one entry per line, and then it has the IP address or the host name, and then the, the public key information. So this is super useful if I can see this and I, I'm the user, say I have now have access to their um, unencrypted private key, and then I also have access to all of the IP addresses that they're logging into. A uh, pretty easy way to pivot around the network and find other systems that uh, I have access to. The next file here that is super interesting is the SSH config. So um, all of that stuff that we've been going over, all of the port forwards, all of the different things are super great, um, but typing all of that's horrible, and I'm a lazy hacker. And once again, the SSH developers, uh, they know that, I guess, and they came up with a solution for it. So that's this SSH config. Uh, like all most of the other SSH stuff, the default or the, the kind of system-wide configuration is in Etsy SSH, and then the user configuration is in .SSH in the user's home directory. Um, that config file looks like this. So here, someone has set up the um, a host called Bounce. The username is Bob. They're logging into 10.10.10.10. .10 they would like to do a local forward of port 8080 to 192.168.1.10.80. They're gonna do a dynamic forward for 1080, and then they're gonna do a remote forward for 8080 on 192.168.1.10.8080. Uh, on the command line, you can just do SSH bounce, and then all of those configs will get set in the command line. You don't have to do anything at all anymore. It's just SSH bounce. It'll tab complete if you have bash completion. Super awesome. Um, when you land on a system, if you have access to this config file, this is another way to find systems that people are logging into because they'll have a bunch of configs like this for uh, easy mode accessing the systems that they access. And you can see, okay, so this Bob guy has access to 10.10.10.10 and likes to check out these other systems on these ports. So something I can try to do. Uh, another fun thing you can do with SSH config is get it to do stuff that people are not intending. <clears throat> so let's say in this scenario, um, 
I know that Bob is SSHing from the server that he's on, 10.10.10.10, to that system that he has internally. Every time he does that, I would like to get a shell back to me on 4141 from his system. Uh, with SSH config, I can do that. So here I configure it, say, say I'm on his server for some reason. I have access to his SSH config. I'm going to go ahead and I like to set this up for all hosts. Uh, by default, you're not permitted to run a local command, but luckily in the config file, you can just tell it to let you do that. Uh, and what I'm going to do here is tell it the local command is to uh, netcat me a bin bash shell to my IP address on my listener and background and then do whatever else Bob was trying to do. So uh, every time Bob logs into a host, it will spin a shell back to me and um, I'll get access to his system. So say my shells keep dying or I just want to kind of maintain access in a super easy uh Lightweight white. Another config file that is super awesome is this uh, run commands file or RC file. Um, this similarly has the Etsy, Etsy version or the user version, but what this does is this runs a command when the user is logging in right before it drops them to a shell. So back to our scenario, say I'm actually on this this far system, and now I want a shell to come back to me every time somebody logs in. So when somebody logs into this system, it sends me a shell. What that looks like here is I just put this simple uh, netcat listener, just like the other one roughly in this, I say netcat spit a shell back to me on my listener IP address on um, port 4141 and then background and go ahead and keep doing whatever it is that people want to do. So. Uh, I encourage people to look at the config files. There's a ton more things you can do in there. These are kind of simplified versions for slides and to demonstrate the purposes. Uh, with the config files and the port forwarding, you can really get yourself into pr some pretty nifty scenarios with that uh, jump proxy command or proxy jump or uh, command uh, or config option. And then also it goes in the config file. Um, with those, you can set up really intricate port forwards and get through all sorts of different interesting things. And like I was saying before, really kind of run havoc on networks and for someone trying to trace stuff back. Uh, now let's look at a couple different ways that I've successfully gotten creds out of SSH. Um, the first one being, say I'm on a system and I know someone is logging into other systems, I see their SSH config but I don't have their private key. They're not even using private keys. I just know they're using passwords. So I want to be able to get to that system that they're getting to, but I need to get that somehow. So a thing I, I like to do is I set, I, I create a little shell script here that's in their path before the normal SSH command. So the SSH command by, by default is in user bin SSH. Here I'm making a shell script called user local bin SSH that prompts the user for a password again, and then writes that password to a temp file, and then just SSHs for them. So what that looks like, and I'm sure people that are used to SSH, is you SSH out, it asks you for your password, you typoed it, it just asks you for your password again, you typed it right, you're good to go, and then eventually you exit. And you can see here that in temp.creds, I've now stolen that super secret password, and I have Bob's password of 192.168.1.10. I'm able to pivot and kind of be on to the next thing. Additionally, let's, so let's say the other way is true. Someone's SSHing into a server that I have access to, and I want to see what their password is. Um, here, I use the debug tool called strace, which just looks for all of the system calls that happen in the binary. So I find the SSH process, I attach SS, uh, strace to that SSHD process, and I tell it to just show me the reads, because I know just, I know how the SSH daemon works. I know that when you connect into it, it sends you a prompt and then reads your password from you. So here, I'm telling it to just uh, show me all of the reads. And there are a lot of reads. So I've gone ahead and grepped them for this magic string that happens right before the password, just as part of the protocol. And here you can see I've stolen this, this password of super secret from someone when they're logging into the SSH. 
another really fun one here is um, using this Paramico to create your own SSH server. So this is kind of the most basic example of this that I can show and make it actually fit in a slide and be useful. But the idea here is say I'm on um, a server and it's not running SSH, but I know someone is trying to log in. I need to speak enough of the SSH protocol to get them to give me their password, but I don't necessarily want to let them log in because I don't know what they're trying to do and I don't want to implement the entirety of all of SSH. So let's kind of run through this Python code a little bit. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do here is for this, this line here, I'm going to go ahead and grab the TCP socket or create a TCP socket. I'm going to bind on 22. So this means I have to have access to open those uh, non-ephemeral ports. I'm going to listen for one connection and then uh, accept for that connection. So once I'm connect, once I've got a connection, I let myself know, Hey, someone from this adder has connected to me. Then I'm going to take advantage of Paramico and I'm going to create, uh, they call it transport in the, um, in the Paramico implementation. Uh, with that transport, I'm going to go ahead and add a server with um, the Paramico RSA key. So I have just a test key. So like I said before, when you SSH out and it says, I don't recognize this, here's the public key. This is going to be that key that it gives them. So this is one chance that they could detect this. So if they're trying to SSH in and it's a key that they don't recognize, you should just say no, unless you know that um, there's a key that you should be seeing. Um, but most people just say yes, because they assume it's a server they haven't seen. And then I'm going to go ahead and start it with my server and tell it to just serve and then accept the connection. So what this looks like here is this now uses my server. They connect in, they get the SSH protocol does its negotiation and says, the only thing I can do is password authentication. So they'll get a password prompt from the client because it knows how to speak enough of the protocol. And then they'll send me the username and password to my SSH server. And that uh, the Paramico server will call this check auth with the username and password that it got. I can say, hey, cool, check it out. I got a username and password and then tell it, uh, no, that's not a valid username and password. So from the user's point of view, they tried to SSH in, the SSH failed. They don't know why it is. They don't know what this box is anyway. It's not supposed to be on their network. So kind of ignore this spawn a connect back shell. That's not what's actually happening. I'm actually starting an SSH server here. So um, start my super secret, awesome SSH server um, just with Python. It tells me, hey, I got a connection from here. And then, uh, hey, that connection sent me Bob as the username and sent me Bob's super secret password. So uh, I now have that password. I know where they came from. I can probably try to log into that and see if I can pivot from there or use that credential somewhere else on the network. So uh, that is kind of an intro and some a little bit deeper, but not super crazy deep dive into all of the cool, not all of, but a bunch of the cool things you can do with SSH, um, you saw that just by default, it gives you remote shell, shell access, uh, lets you do port forwarding. You can download, upload files. It's all encrypted. Um, that port forwarding, you can use that to accomplish almost any sort of hopping that you need to be able to do around network segmentation. So really, if you can get to port 22 and you have some sort of credential material to log into that port 22, you can do quite a bit inside a network. You can get access to systems you might not necessarily, um, you're not necessarily supposed to have access to. You can get around network protections that are trying to block you from doing things. You can mask your traffic in different protocols via proxies. You can make your traffic look like it's coming from different systems via proxies. Uh, with all of the configuration options you saw, you can trick the system into doing things or really trick users into doing things that you're not expecting. Um, different ways you can run SSH commands such that uh, it's harder to trace or see that information on the system um, and uh, download, upload, exfil all of the data. And then really the cool thing about this is you can use all of these SSH options. These are the basic ones. You can combine all of this to make yourself the craziest network map that you want, 
pivot through all of the different things. Uh, SSH is becoming more and more ubiquitous across environments. Uh, it's now coming on Windows 10, you have WSL. Um, it's very, very, very useful. Uh, so I hope, I hope that was uh, helpful. I hope it made you think a, a time or two about SSH and what you can do with it and all that kind of stuff. Um, I hope to stay connected with everybody. Uh, Randori Attack is my team's Twitter. Um, we are kind of always hiring someone at somewhere. So um, hit up our careers um, off of our webpage. And then um, if you're into uh, information like this, follow our blog. Uh, Randori TTPs are tips, tricks, and POCs. Um, check that out for lots of information like this. Um, and then lastly, uh, I'm pretty passionate about this. We need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and popping all these shells is awesome. And maintaining all of this access is super great. Uh, but we also need to make sure that we're uh, taking the time to get away and uh, keeping ourselves fit. So hashtag Rad Team Fit. Check us out on Twitter. Uh, there's a bunch of discords all over the place and, uh, we've got a bunch of groups and doing all sorts of really awesome stuff. Um, and that's what I got. Thanks everybody. Uh, hashtag red team fit.